Hello and welcome to the Heads and Volleys podcast with me, Lee Dunn. This is going to be episode five of Volunteer Power, the mini series on the volunteers that make soccer happen. And today is going to be a completely different and interesting perspective because this is coming from a team manager. So I'd like to welcome Kelly Papora to Heads and Volleys. Hi, Kelly. Hi, how are you? Doing well. How are you? Good. Just riding out this quarantine. I mean, (laughs) it's like a Groundhog Day in some type of a vacuum, right? I mean, same day, same day, same day. Sometimes (laughs) the weather changes. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's been wild for us right now. We're trying to figure out what return to play looks like. And I know. And I, I feel like as a parent, we feel the same way. It's like, on the one hand, I really want my kids to get outside and play <laughs> like mm-hmm. with other kids besides each other because the sibling rivalry is at an all-time high. <laughs> so, so have your kids been doing Zoom stuff with soccer? Um, not so much. We actually, we're temporarily in the Presidio. We have tons of space, so we just go play outside. And we opted awesome. out of camp. Um, they were really, we went full digital, our school, like within three days of closure. So that was awesome. But they were, then we had all these zoom activities and they were extreme zoom fatigue. <laughs> like after doing six hours a day on a device with like a one hour lunch break, they just, I was like, yeah. do you guys want to, and they were like, we don't want to do any more zoom. <laughs> like we want to do no more zoom, zoom this summer. <laughs> yes. It's, it's a challenge. And I think it's also important then like that's made me realize what activities they really like specifically for the activity and then which ones are also like, I mean, soccer, I think a huge part of it is being outside with yeah. particularly with the younger, like Madeline is now she's more tolerant, but I think for like the micro age group, I think oh, them wow. being with friends, right. And being outside is there's probably like a 50% of them that participated that age for that. Right. It's, it's not just a love of the game. It's more that they want to have, that experience, that exposure, and they want to be able to do that. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. So you and uh, your husband, Devin, you guys got involved how long ago with with youth soccer? <laughs> uh, so let's see, Oliver, when I when we did our very first tot soccer, it's kind of crazy, was before he was two years old and he's now 11. So <laughs> that's a long time, nine, nine years. Yeah. Um, we weren't in micro at that point. They were, they were so young. They weren't even, there was no division for them. Um, but it's been, we'll just say it's been a long road. It's been totally positive. Right. I mean, we did not know, honestly, when I, when we first got into it, (laughs) I was trying to find Oliver an outlet to move his body and to be outside. And he was the kid who never had, he never stopped running. Right. (laughs) And so we had a great coach, and I remember a friend of ours who was a year older was doing like a hot soccer program. And they're like, well, we don't usually take them before they're like two and a half. And I was like, let's just like drop in and try it. You can decide <laughs> if it's a good fit. And he couldn't believe that Oliver kept up with everybody. And so then that was that. I mean, he fell in love with the game. I think he was, I mean, his first word was ball. So, I mean, that was a clue right there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Uh, yeah. And then, you know, be, again, being outside. And then once we sort of got down the line and it became more of a community thing, it was also a great experience. We're both transplants here. Um, and so we've now been in the Bay area for 20 years. So we've been around, but there's, you always discover new things about the city and new neighborhoods when you're yeah. going to these parks that you're like, this is such a little gem. I didn't even know this was here. Right. Because before <laughs> you have kids, you sort of stick to commercial strips or like you know, you sort of hike the trails, you know, and so it's been yeah. a nice excuse to get out and meet new people and see new places. I think that's another really positive. That's an thing interesting to perspective forward. too, because in the city, of course, we get allocated fields all over and some right. people don't like to travel or they like the local field, the convenient <laughs> ones. That's an interesting perspective too, to get across the city and see different parts. Yeah. And I think that's also like when you, when you, because ch- like we, we get, I get that like flack from my parents, like, why do we have these games in the nowhere? And I sort of wish that they did it. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs in, in Long Island. We would have half of our games would be home games and half would be away games. So I, I like when it works out that way. It seems like sort of the sweet spot. I mean, I know you guys don't have control, but I like when we get to play sort of from a home field so people get comfortable and like for yeah. some of the more introverted or reserved kids, like sort of having a familiar space sometimes makes them feel like 
you know, like they're at home and they get a little bit more willing to play. Like none of them want to play keeper. It's really funny with the girls, the boys all wanted to try it out. And with the girls are like, I don't want to get hit in the face of the ball or I'm scared someone's going to kick me or, um, so it's a really different experience with the two genders. Um, and so I feel like when we play on a familiar field with the girls, particularly it sometimes enables them to take risks that they wouldn't otherwise be willing to take. Um, but I like, again, getting out. So I feel like it's a nice balance where we've had a couple seasons that it worked out. We sort of played one or two games at the same field and then we went someplace and then we went someplace and then we came back. And so when you get that balance to like both push them out of their comfort zone, like, you know, in a new setting and then also in a, in what they're doing on the field, it's, it's a good sort of combination. That's really interesting too. The idea of the same field in, in terms of familiarity, because I remember even playing as a kid playing on the same field and it's like knowing the, knowing the field, feeling comfortable. Yeah. yeah. So you even know where like the potholes are, which sounds crazy, but you're like, Oh wait, <laughs> don't forget about the gopher hole. Right. I home mean, field advantage. Yeah. It, there is, there is a little <laughs> bit of home field advantage. Right. And I mean, it's, it varies. Right. I mean, there's also, I mean, we're blessed in this city to have, you know, larger complexes. So, I mean, if you're always playing at West sunset, it doesn't necessarily matter which part of West sunset you're playing on. Um, as long as you, you know, you know, the field, I think it, you know the location. Yeah. And yeah. again, some of it corresponds to age and some of it corresponds to, um, I think even just parents, right? That when the parents get tense about being late because of the parking, then the kids get tense about getting on. And it sounds terrible. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, you always do the buffers of arrival time and they still don't follow it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was so, going to ask you, that'll lead me into a question about parents too. But first of all, how long have you been a team manager? And has it always been kind of you and Devin doing it together as team manager and coach? Uh, no, it hasn't. Um, so my, Devin never coached for my son. So he only started coaching when Madeline went into kindergarten. So she's third grade this year. So this will be his fourth year coaching. Okay. So we started on the other end where we had an independent coach and we had this group um, that, again, it was a neighborhood group and it wasn't even like, we didn't have jerseys, but it sort of evolved into this group. And when we first played, it was boys and girls, both of them. And then eventually this group of boys sort of stuck with it. And he said, Hey, do you guys want to try doing some games and doing micro soccer? And we were like, sure, we'll try it. And then it sort of just stuck, um, which was great because we had kids from all different schools. Um, you know, it was totally word of mouth and no. So I coached with him and they went competitive eventually. So they did, you know, a little time in micro and then they became a competitive team. We played a year competitively with him and a coach working under him. Um, and then we moved to a different club. And so we've had, we've had four clubs that we've played with in this household. So we've gotten to taste many different flavors, um, which is also nice because you realize that every club also has a culture on its own. And that when you're shopping, you're not just shopping for your player, you're shopping for your family and for club chemistry and dynamics. It's like school shopping. Yeah. Um, so no, so I managed pretty much from the get-go. I, I got roped in. I didn't know what I was signing up for. Um, and then it is very much a, once you know the system, it's much sort of easier to do it. So n- now when I do it with Madeline, I'm definitely more of the planner back office person. And then I like to have a cohort or a co-manager that is much more wants to be gang- gung-ho about snacks because... <laughs> The girls <laughs> love having lemonade and snacks after their games and they're being like, I like snack. lemonade and snacks after games. So I can only imagine how much the kids like it. Right. A little social <laughs> element. So yes. I like having a person who wants to do more of that. It's tons, but like, you know, the more sort of, not that I don't like the fun stuff, but it's nice to not feel like you're constantly bombarding people all the time yeah. with the same voice. And then also sometimes to just say, you know, Hey, this funny thing happened, or I haven't heard back from so-and-so. And and do you have any idea? Like just another ear in the community, what, what's going on? Because sometimes it just gives you another contact person. Um, and it's also more practical, right? Like, I mean, now that we've, I mean, I have felt the amp up in, um, you know, security, right? Like everybody being fingerprinted, everybody that takes the field. Um, but also just in the, in the, seriousness, right? So, I mean, I think that SFYS has done a really great job pushing down some things that really used to happen more in competitive soccer in, and in older soccer down the pipeline to make it more uniform and to, you know, provide accountability, which is great. But it also means that if you don't know the system, there's a lot of pieces to learn. So 
I think yeah, that's part of that. why I've continued to do it. And I that's also think cool. mentor- mentorship. So I had a parent that helped me, um, that had a player that also played with the same independent coach who was two years older. And so she really held my hand when I was getting on board. Um, and I still sometimes call her to pick her brain about things. Um, and so then I've also done that. So I have two moms, um, one who manages the other team for my daughter's school, um, in her grade. And then another one who co-manages with me and she will now be, she's now mentoring for her son, for her son's grade, three teams. So you sort of find this, it's sort of like you pass the torch to another person so that then this can sort of keep being a sport with a ton of parent involvement. I think that's, that's important. It's so you just triggered something in my mind that we do coach mentorship and coach education and we do referee mentorship and referee yeah. education, but we don't really do anything about managers. And when I'm thinking about a team manager, team managers make everything possible, even for in the competitive level with the, the managers that I have, they always show up with game cards. They always have the player cards or the kids are always in the right gear. They, everything is just so organized and then there's so there's so little that goes into helping team managers. It's kind of like you're a team manager. You have to do this. You have to get all the kids in the right place and and you have to get everybody registered. You have to make sure everyone's set, but we don't really tell you how or often if you don't have that mentor or someone to help you along the way. So let me ask you what, um, go back to the the idea of parents and, and working with parents and, most coaches will often complain parents are the problem. It's always about parents. I, I'm involved in Twitter a lot with, with coaches and the number one complaint is always parents. And I've never really had that because I think I always try and involve parents. And so what have you, you talked about telling them to get there 20 minutes before the half an right. hour before the game. So what are the tips do you have? What are the ways you do you kind of help educate or work with parents within, within the kind of club sport environment? Um, I think that, I'm big. I really value transparency. So it helps me as a parent when I know, right. I mean, your teachers share at school, right. And your administration shares what they're working on and what they're doing. And so I always tell people, I'm like, I try not to bombard you with information and give you too much, but I also want you to know that there is a ton of work behind the scenes that goes into all these things. Um, and so to, to be honest with them, and I try to also create realistic timelines. So I've learned to buffer, um, things over the years, but I do, I mean, there's always times when something comes up and we need an answer on something or somebody, somebody's scan of their birth certificate, or all of a sudden their picture got deleted or there's some hiccup, right. That you need something and you always need it, like, 24 hours. <laughs> um, so to, I try to not you know, create a fire when there's no fire. Right. And I think my parents respect that, that, that by doing a little planning myself, um, and again, having a, having a template for that. Um, I mean, I have to say I was an early subscriber for team snap and, um, we I've used several other team platforms, um, with other school teams and other sports. And it's really is hands down the best one, um, that, you know, for, for me and for my parent community needs, um, being able to push out, um, all the information and have it all stored there. I get so many parents and so many families where one parent is the main contact person. And when that person needs to travel for work or get sick, it's like a fire, right? Like it's emergency (laughs) and the other parent doesn't know what to do. And so by having a centralized database, I'm like, it's always there. You always know how to log in. And all of my emails are archived. All the information that you need, all of the field locations, everything is in one place. And so I don't really know. I haven't used another um, software engine that has allowed me to do that. I mean, we we use Google Sheets for certain things, but it's still not the same, right? And there's a lot more sort of searching. And so, I mean, just the it's easy to read. It's easy to read from a mobile device, which is key. (laughs) Um, all of those things, all of those things are important. Um, so that's one. And then even as a, as a, from the managing side, I can go back and replicate and see when I did things, like when I pushed out certain information and how long it took me between, you know, collecting information and being able to do something. So it sort of lets me plan and project manage a little better. So I would say those two things, I use Google sheets for a ton of stuff and I use, um, team snap for overall season and even just like, um, we always do an end of season 
a more social gathering and a fun practice where we do, you know, parents versus kids, or we do, um, you know, wear a fun costume or, you know, whatever. We're going to play with two balls, right? Whatever the sort of fun thing that we're going to do is. And so we try to include other family members in that. So we do it sometimes at a different practice time so that it's either later or on a weekend at a park so that, you know, we can have older siblings or younger siblings or, you know, both parents involved. And so we try to plan that very early in the season to make sure that we let everybody gets to be part of it. Um, and again, then everybody dog ears it because it's on their team staff calendar. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And we get to do that, which is great. And also I even think, um, I mean, the payments has changed a little bit over the years, um, but it's another great way, you know, you guys collect payments for the league, but sometimes if you want to do something else and, you know, it sort of varies. Rec soccer is a little bit different than competitive soccer, um, but we also have always cultivated a, um, you know, we want everybody to be able to play. And so, or go to the pizza party. And so you, there was always a way to create, you know, if you want to sponsor somebody else coming to the pizza party too, you know, sort of saying, this is what the pizza party is. You know, if you want to contribute more, it's always welcome. And just sort of, you know, create transparency around that also so that everybody gets to be part of things. That's awesome. It's so good to, to have that set up. And I agree. I, I mean, even just from the simple level of having my calendar synced up with my team snap and knowing where I need to be and when I need to be there. That's so good, but kind of fostering that team environment. Because I was going to ask you about the idea of like teams, and that yeah. it's it's within San Francisco. We're pretty fortunate that most recreational teams are schools, so the kids go to school together. Right. The families tend to know each other. But I mean, even across the country, there are groups of recreational kids that are just put together to play soccer. And so right. the idea of fostering this team and using things like Team Snap to have this this I guess, schedule like we're going to have this pizza party here, we're going to do this and. I know I've used TeamSnap as well to say we have a game out of town at 3 p.m. We're going to meet for lunch at 11 a.m. or at 12 p.m. or whatever the time may be to right. just help. And it, it just coordinates everybody to be in the same place at the same time. Yeah. And we used it even the first coach that we played with, even when our our team moved on and other teams moved on, we used to do a drop-in soccer. We used to do Friday night soccer, which was so super fun. And it was like, you know, sort of like a five to six year spread. So whoever showed up, we would sort of, make and balance teams based on that spread. And so we just created exactly a team snap group that wasn't actually a formal team. And every time, you know, we do it once or twice a month and every time there was going to be drop in soccer on Friday night at whatever given park, we would just post it and push it out to everybody and say, Hey, show up if you can. And then whoever was there, we'd like find the closest pizza parlor on Yelp and walk over there. And it was really, awesome. really good community <laughs> builder. And again, really casual, right? Like you don't, you don't pay anything. Like we'll, we'll be there with the goals and the cones and the, and the, you know, jerseys and you just come. Um, just and it was a really life. good way to do that. Yeah. That's brilliant. So let me ask you about, um, so the glitter mermaids is the, is one of the teams. And so I, it is. I'm and so it's stuck. I didn't think it was going <laughs> to stick. That was my daughter's, my daughter named us that I think she was six at the time. That's so. awesome. Yeah, and so I'm then I just so, had to go uh, find glitter, right? I mean, who, who doesn't need more glitter in their lives for jerseys, right? Yeah, no, and I, I, I come from, I guess, the idea that everybody should, all the soccer teams should be soccer teams. So they should be Manchester United, or they should be Chelsea, and the, or they should be the Portland Thorns. And the idea that then it's like a, a it's relative and it's like a, they, they can, you know, like Little League, you play as the San Francisco Giants or the Oakland A's. Right. And yeah. so I've, I've always thought along the lines of saying, well, no, you should be a, a soccer team name to replicate the big, the big soccer. And then when I joined San Francisco was it three, four years ago, and I met all of these team names and I coached a team last year called the Raging Bulldogs. And there you go. It kind of gave, they had ownership. And to go back to what you were saying about the, um, like the girls feeling comfortable, they, they must enjoy that they, they are the Glitter Mermaids. That's, they, they own that. That's, that's who they belong to. They do. And they, they're so funny. I mean, they love to wear their mermaid's gear and they all get these, like, we go full, full board. Our socks look like uh, scales and fins. If you've yeah. seen us on the field. <laughs> I have, um, yes. <laughs> so any, you know, and it also helps again, I think that making the sport accessible. Um, I think that there's lots of different ways to play soccer in the San Francisco Bay area and levels to play at, but there's still people who, if the parents were never into organized sports, um, 
or if the child is more shy or more introverted or really is out there because they want to be with their friends, whatever makes them feel empowered to get on the field, right? So, I mean, you know, we have to wear our shin guards and our cleats and be safe. But beyond that, um, you know, there's a lot of flexibility. And I, I think what having my daughter has made me realize is it's important to have fun with it. Um, yes. And sometimes that's the thing that gets, you know, pulls a girl out of her shell is they're so excited to be out there and they're, <laughs> their jerseys sparkle from so <laughs> far away if it's a sunny day that you can't miss them. It makes us easy to find when you're in a sea of people. People are like, oh, I saw the hot pink and the glitter. I knew exactly where you were. Um, so, you know, it, it, it helps. Every little bit helps. That's brilliant. I, I'm a convert, I'll admit. Now, I, I thought that it was crazy and it was silly and everybody should have a professional team name that they can aspire to be, but I'm a convert. I, I'll, <laughs> I'll give the Glitter Mermaids that. that. <laughs> and it's fun, too. I mean, it, it's, I also think of, you know, we live in a city where I feel like wearing your colors is sort of a theme, um, and so it, it really fits us, and I like being out there. I mean, I, I do also like that the clubs really have an identity, so you can go out there and you know what club somebody is playing for in, in on the more competitive side. And I think that the, the players feel that pride in having that uniform. But I think if you're playing with your school or you're playing with your friends, um, you should do it right. And have a little fun and experiment. And also, you know, it, I also think it means that every, every team is a different experience and it really lets you embody that. And, um, and it's fun. We love seeing people on the field and being like, Oh, what are you? Oh, you're at the bumblebees. That's so cool. And <laughs> the kids also, a lot of the, a lot of the parents, I think, especially in rec soccer, let the children have input into the name and you get to hear the stories. Then it's a conversation starter with your opponents, which is also a really good way to break the ice. I think for the girls, um, yeah. you know, to, to open the door to, Although it can be scary to talk to a kid from a different school that you don't know that you're supposed to be like facing off against, you know, <laughs> so it's another way to, to get them excited to be out there. So then you've had the experience of club and recreational and there's often yep. a, a stigma, I think, or like a, this unwritten pressure of, of get to club as quick as you can, become a club player as quick as you can, join a club, play, play, play competitive soccer. And we, we do a lot of work with, with the league for just kind of helping to educate and, and just give as much advice as we can that you don't have to play competitive soccer. You don't have to feel like that's the only place you can go play. So do you, I guess my question is really around kind of that whole environment of, of club soccer and of recreational soccer that there's a place for everybody. And I think, do you, do you see that there's, there's the pressure like that? Do you, do you see that parents maybe like itching to get to competitive soccer because they think there's like this, the grass is green or over there that is going to help their kid get to the next level of college or whatever, even at the younger ages. Right. Um, I do think that there, that that does happen. Um, I think it, I think it's a funny storm of how it happens in the sense of like when my son ended up in competitive soccer, it would felt really organic. Right. I mean, it wasn't, we were with the group, the group stayed together. We didn't, you know, nobody set out thinking we were going that direction. And then we ended up that there and it was wonderful. And then we sort of like wrote it as long as we could. And then we eventually like, it was time for people to move on. And that was a sad thing, but the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, and with my daughter, we've bumped up, dump, we've bumped up against this a couple of times, right? Cause we, we've just sort of crossed into the age where people start to play competitive more. And we've, you know, talked about whether she wanted to do that. And also, it's easier to find like futsal opportunities, for example, if you're with a club because they sort of manage everything and then you can just ha also have access to, to soccer all winter long. Um, so yes, I do think there is this sort of pressure, but I also think that if you talk to a lot of the really great coaches in the Bay area individually, when they're not <laughs> recruiting you at the soccer fair, um, they will tell you that, it's better for younger athletes' bodies to cross train, to play more than one sport. And if you commit to competitive soccer at a really young age, it's really hard to do that. Um, and it's really then only possible to cultivate body development in different forms of coordination if you also have either a family member who has access to that second sport or a school that's providing that in some other way and can manage to jenga all those things into your very limited schedule. <laughs> Um, so yes, I do think it's there and I'm, I'm so glad that my daughter is still playing recreational soccer. And if she decides she wants to play competitive soccer in one year or two year or 
later, then we'll, we'll go down that road again. Um, but I do think it's, it's important to, um, honor both of those things. And I think there's pluses and minuses to both. I think a lot of the, the thing about rec soccer is that it's the parent involvement level. Like, as you said, it's not, I mean, I guess it is more because they're coaching too, but it's also just, there's less guidance. So it really depends like how well things go and how cohesive things are. A lot of it depends on what, the, which parents are involved and what the team is and what everyone's experience is. And so right. I think, right. I think if, I think if it's possible to create mentorship opportunities, either through schools or through the league or what, whatever, that that might help provide some of those other opportunities, right. To, to keep that sort of more consistency and have more longevity. Um, yeah. because even if you're, even if you're part of your roster is changing every year, it is easier to keep a group together. Like it's, it's, and it's sort of good for their development. If there's some new players coming in and mixing it up, but also they get to sort of see how, you know, how they're developing in regards to the same other kids they've been, they've been playing with. Um, but competitive soccer wants to, I mean, it's a machine, man. Once you get, once you get into it, <laughs> pretty good. they they know like just how to keep you going. Um, yeah. And it does also have a lot of great, like, as I said, I think that there's, there's always additional practice opportunities, right? If, if you're with either because they have another team or they have another coach available, if you want outside time or because they have lessons available, which I mean, yeah. you guys have been doing a great job also providing outside curriculum, I think, which is, is more new. I, that wasn't available when, you know, Oliver was coming up. Um, that was really only something you had access to if you were playing competitive soccer. Um, and then also I think field space, right? So where are we allowed to do that? What are the rules? And there is no sort of comprehensive way to just get on and say, here's the day we want to do something or what's available in my neighborhood and what are the rules? If we don't want to hold weekly practice and once a month, we just want to go do X, Y, Z. It's a really cumbersome permit process. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so I think if there was a way to sort of say, if we want to like this, this drop in soccer that we used to do, we used to do years ago when the field systems were not online the way they are and there was less accountability and there was also less demand for fields. And we literally could just like go to a park in a neighborhood because we only had, you know, 10 or 12 kids and it was okay. Right. We weren't doing. And if, if we were in somebody's way or the dog, somebody's dog came running through the game, that was just part of the game. Right. Just didn't work. <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's also just, you know, community and neighborhood and we have to want to, we all have to decide that that's something we want to nurture and then figure out how to make that possible. I think you're right too about club soccer being a machine. Cause I, you know, I'm in the club soccer environment too. And so we, I know the club I work for has resources that can get additional fields or non city fields. So like the universities or high schools right. that have fields that we can get access to. So then you go from playing within the city recreational program once or twice a week, maybe a third, if you've, got some sort of pickup program going on or some other clinic to schedule three practices at least sometimes a fourth as well and then some sort of specialized training too it it makes sense why people would want to move towards the club environment I, I definitely understand that and I think what we do with the organization part of my role is is more programming like that is more supplemental stuff that shows people you can still do all of this without actually joining a club or without feeling like you can join a club. And it's not that we don't want to take away. And there's definitely a place for kids, I think, in the competitive environment. But often it, when players leave and they, they don't necessarily need to, teams fall apart. And especially if they're school teams and there's 12 kids on a team and three yeah. decide to move on, that team falls apart. And now we've it's got, we, we always try and put players uh, teams that have fallen apart together with other teams but it's outside of a comfort zone or it's it's a different place it's another side of the city it's 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 yeah. all completely new and once they play for a few years and it doesn't work anymore i think that's where we find some of the attrition and, and we lose those kids unfortunately and so part of our drive as sfys is to to keep kids playing and and by offering right. more and more things for them to play within help them stay so if they just want to train once a week and play in a game they can do that and if they want to take supplemental stuff they can Right. And Keep even, I mean, like I said, and it's amazing, like the logistics that can become overwhelming, which sounds crazy, but, um, I mean, I know you guys have the office available to always have meetings, but a lot of people are like, Oh, I can't get there or the hours don't work for me. And I'm like, well, you guys know that you can rent a room at the public library for free. Like if you go, if you're a San Francisco resident, you have a library card, you can rent it for a meeting. For, and people are like, 
No, I mean, I can't, I've literally in like, after hundreds of parents telling them this information, I've maybe met two that knew this, right? And again, it's just resources that are out there, which you're like, well, just to have like, because you need to at some point put your heads together to talk about whether you're going to stay together or whether people are going to go competitive or you just have logistical stuff that you need to take care of, right? So, and it's hard to do those things right after a soccer game when your kids are all going crazy and the next team's trying to come on and the referee's yelling at <laughs> you off the field and you're like, I'm sorry, we're just having a good <laughs> So, you know, again, those the, ha- mentorship, I think, helps create that. And, and even like going through the Parks and Rec field permit process, right? And knowing who to call. I think there's a lot, there's definitely, I will say, in the soccer community, a lot of knowing knowing who to call, right? If you have a question about something. And I think, like I said, I still sometimes reach out to, um, you know, my old mentor or a coach I know from a different club or a team manager I know from a different club. And I was like, what was that thing you were telling me about? Um, so to just get the information that I need. And I tend to (laughs) be a person that's less shy about that, but I know it gets overwhelming. And I think that that's a huge part of, soccer success in the Bay Area. I think that (laughs) if we could all figure out a way to to pool our resources and be friendly about it instead of like, you know, sort of having a leg up and because we got more better practice lots and sort of elbowing each other out, then um, it would be really positive. And I'm, I'm wondering if as, as the field shrinks a little bit um, because of the pandemic and our ability to play changes that that focus might shift because those of us who want to keep doing it, um, you know, we need each other, right? Like we need opponents. Or, or <laughs> That's sport. a good point. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it gives us an opportunity to sort of reframe and say, you know, here's what's working really well and maybe here's what's not. And, you know, how do we do, how do we make this a safe experience and a positive experience for everybody in this sort of new, new world new. of, <laughs> of post or in the pandemic but hopefully someday post pandemic yeah. <laughs> well kelly thank you so much i uh, the idea of this volunteer power series was to show that soccer doesn't happen without people like you for the work that you do for the just the hours that you do spend as a volunteer and like you say even the idea of mentoring and and sharing what you know and and then empowering other people to then empower their players to play, whether that's finding a middle school gym or whether that's finding another place to play on a random Friday night in the middle of the city somewhere. So I just want to thank you from San Francisco and soccer and from me as well, because this is the game that I love. This is the game that I grew up doing. I moved to the US 11 years ago and was continuing to pursue soccer. And so speaking to somebody who, who empowers players the way you do, I just want to thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. I'm happy to do it. And we're so thankful for everything that you guys do. I mean, I would have done anything in this entire nine years that I've been at this if it wasn't for SFYS. So, you know, it's a, it's a reciprocal, (laughs) it's a reciprocal feeling. All for the power of the game. So thank you so much. And go Glitter Mermaids is my (laughs) my sign off on that one. I've said it over and over again in this mini series, and I'll honestly continue to say it because the game doesn't happen without wonderful volunteers like Kelly and the other four that I've interviewed so far. So make sure you thank your team manager. Make sure you thank the volunteers that are in the background, making sure that your kids are in the right place and making sure that you get a meeting space that you're looking for all the time or they have the ins and outs of knowing how to get into the library and using a library room or making sure that everybody is at least wearing the same color glitter socks. So again, a huge thank you to Kelly, a huge thank you to all of the volunteers that make soccer happen.